Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Friday, May 30th, 2014. And here's a quick look what's coming up. Tonight, how militarizing federal agents makes U.S. citizens potential targets. And InfoWars continues exclusive coverage of Bilderberg 2014. All over the news that a lot of even U.S. publications are saying, yeah, this looks pretty serious. Why is it this being covered? I mean, they're going now from ignoring it to laughing at us and admitting it's real to not laughing at us. Only a few publications called us people that believe in space aliens and lizards. Yesterday, the Washington Post disclosed a disturbing Department of Defense directive detailing which circumstances might be appropriate for the federal government to use lethal military force against us. That's right, the American people. In a December 2010 directive entitled Defense Support of Civil Authorities, the DOD talks about plans regarding military support for civilian law enforcement. So much for posse comitatus. Another blatant constitutional violation as it looks like the federal government continues to prepare for war against the American people. Now, this would go into effect in the event of a large scale unexpected civil disturbance when federal action, including the use of military force, will be authorized by the president, the secretary of defense, or other civil authorities. Now, don't act so surprised, folks. I mean, we've been warning you about this for a very long time. And don't forget, it was the DOD training manuals that we discovered last year, along with the DHS, official DHS studies, they listed the Patriot Movement, the Liberty Movement, and the Tea Party as potential terrorists, along with uh, parents who homeschool their children, returning veterans, law-abiding gun owners, and you, the conspiracy theorist watching this right now, you might be a potential terrorist according to the insane federal government. Now, the DOD training manual says, for example, nowadays, instead of dressing in sheets or publicly espousing hate messages, Many extremists will talk of individual liberties and states' rights, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and they also talk about how to make the world a better place. That's right, it also says that the founding fathers would not be welcome in today's military. And I'm telling you, we are just one false flag terror attack away from a total federal takeover. Now, just look at the nation's police departments, for example. They are totally militarized. They've got SWAT teams. They have armored vehicles designed for warfare. They have unmanned drones. I mean, they already resemble an occupying army. Meanwhile, the DHS is stockpiling billions of rounds of ammunition, and the U.S. military just built a $96 million training facility in Virginia that looks just like an American city. Our very own Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs and David Knight, they were able to get exclusive footage of the training facility just before being, uh, being detained by military police. So the military and police are preparing for civil unrest, and the U.S. government can now determine when it's appropriate to use lethal military force against Americans. Wow, I, I tell you what, a brave new world indeed. Meanwhile, the Rand Corporation and the New York Times, they are hyping up a new domestic terror threat. The Rand Corporation is working with the CIA, the FBI, the National Counterterrorism Center, and the DHS to hustle in the next phase in the perpetual war on manufactured terrorism. This is in an article on Infowars.com by Kurt Nimmo. We are now supposed to be worried about American-born and bred terrorists trained by al-Nusra in Syria returning home to wage jihad in the heartland. And this comes after a reported suicide truck bombing allegedly conducted by an unidentified American in Syria. So this is a shadowy and nameless American terrorist. Uh, sounds like a CIA co-op to me. I mean, they're the ones that created the various al-Qaeda terrorist groups to begin with. Yes, our government funds al-Qaeda, or better known around here as al-Qaeda. 
Now, yesterday was the start of the Bilderberg Conference in Copenhagen, Denmark, and as usual, the well, most of the media outlets, with the exception of a handful of alternative media sites, are completely ignoring this historical event that is attended each year for the last, well, 50 years or so by the most influential people in the world. InfoWars, however, continues to put this globalist event and their secretive agenda front and center. And joining us now from Copenhagen, Denmark, is InfoWars Nightly News anchor David Knight, bringing us exclusive coverage from Bilderberg 2014. Hey, um, right off the bat, uh, tell us a little bit about the significance of the mainstream media blackout when it comes to Bilderberg because, I mean, we're talking about the most powerful organization in the world uh, basically fixing the world policies behind closed doors, yet there continues to be a blackout when it comes to these meetings, almost as if there's a, the power elite controls the mainstream media. Have you seen any mainstream media there? Tell us about any mainstream media coverage that you've witnessed. None at all. Actually, there was a little bit of coverage this morning from the Danish media. And it was the purpose of that was to essentially ch change the story story from Bilderberg and what's happening there, coverage of the guy that was arrested yesterday. So what you see happening here is, is what they've always been doing. And of course, throughout past Bilderberg events, it's always been the Washington Post, the New York Times executives that have shown up at Bilderberg. They've been as much a part of this as the bankers, the politicians, the spies. Uh, it's also been the mainstream press. And David Rockefeller has even uh, been quoted as saying, thank you for uh, your coverage or non-coverage of Bilderberg, essentially, to paraphrase what he was saying. We couldn't have done it without you. So he, he thanked them for the fact that they weren't covering it. But what they always do, just like they did last year, they'll try to find something that's fringy or kooky, and they will cover that. And, of course, they need to think about what they perceive as excessive force, whether or not that force was justified or not. Certainly the guy deserved to be arrested. The question is, did they continue using force after he had been subdued? And that's a judgment and a discussion that the Danish people need to have. And of course, they have a police issue with excessive force, just as we do back in the States. Well, that's right. And on the rare occasion that I do see the mainstream media covering Bilderberg, they really downplay the significance, almost as if it's, it's a casual gathering, like they're there just to play golf or, or something like that. But we know better. We know that they are there to set a global agenda. And um, what, what kind of uh, policies are being set this year and who's attending this year? Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about Bilderberg and about the uh, CFR and about the Trilateral Commission, that kind of puts it, I think, in a perspective, because it's kind of a chronological uh, perspective that started with that. Going back to uh, the early 1900s, you had in the Wilson administration, they created the Council on Foreign Relations. And of course, Wilson was a big one world government guy. You know, they created the League of Nations. He wanted, he was on board with that whole agenda. Well, after the CFR was created, it was only in America that they were operating. And they essentially ran most of the uh, State Department Department, the uh, department that's a government, and that continued on. Virtually all of the presidential candidates and the presidential opponents of the two major parties were all CFR members for throughout the 20th century. Even Reagan, who wasn't, Reagan and, and uh, Goldwater were the standouts who were not part of the CFR. But even Reagan, when he got appointed, when he got elected, he appointed over 300 CFR members into the government. So they have been the shadow government. They've exerted a lot of influence. And of course, their agenda has been to create a global government. Now, in the 1950s, in 1954, actually, 60 years ago, Bilderberg held their first event. Now, what that did was that you, that scope was changed from just being in the United States to being the United States and Western Europe. And then in 1973, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Henry Kissinger, working under David Rockefeller, created the Trilateral Commission. That's right. They extended that then from up to North America to Asia. Now what we're seeing this year in 2014, they're bringing in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They're bringing in the Transatlantic Partnership. What they're trying to do is to implement the schemes and the dreams of David Rockefeller and those people for a global governance that is essentially being run by 
uh, multinational corporations, bankers, and the people who consider themselves to be the elite. They that don't like the sovereign states. And so that's what they're trying to do this year. They're trying to do that. And it's a lot it's about a lot more than just economic issues and trade. It's also about taking control of the Internet, trying to do things with these uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Transatlantic Partnership, do things that they could not get passed with SOPA, PIPA, ACTA, CISPA. They were not able to get those enacted in legislation, so now they're trying to do that through the back door, negotiating these treaties that are every bit as secretive as Bilderberg allowed to see what's going on with these treaties, not even our elected officials. And that's essentially, the, in essence, the same thing that's happening here at Bilderberg. Well, that's right. This is about the consolidation of power by the World Banks. They're the ones that are calling the shots. Am I right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's all about money. And, you know, when I was talking to Alex, he had a very, very perceptive take on this mayor of Atlanta. You know, we, we know that they bring politicians in and they groom them uh, to become president or whatever, if they're going to be a, 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 an obedient puppet, let's say. Well, this mayor of Atlanta, why, why is this guy coming in? Well, Alex said, you know, maybe that's part of it. But the other part of it is, is that Atlanta has a red hot real estate market. And if anybody knows what's going on at local government, they know that at the local level, really, the politicians that are predominating there are all about real estate. They usually come from a real estate background. That's been the case in the cities where I've lived, because there's a lot of money to be made if you rezone areas and uh, they can they can build that out. So Alex's comment was maybe this mayor of Atlanta is there passing on some insider information or getting things set up for these bankers to make money. But of course, there's the political aspect of it, too. They do want to have a puppet. And in the past, we have seen that a year after an unknown governor from Arkansas went to Bilderberg, Bill Clinton became uh, president shortly after Tony Blair went to Bilderberg. He became prime minister. Margaret Thatcher came to Bilderberg, and they did not hit it off. She was very angry with their agenda when she found out what was going on. And, in a, and within one, week, one year, she was replaced by essentially an internal coup within her own party. They removed her. So we see this has happened over and over again. There's a lot of control. And essentially, it's about the money because they want to own everything. They don't want there to be a middle class. They want to take over control of everything. That they, they can never have enough. You know, when they asked David Rockefeller how much is enough, he famously said, just a little bit more. Well, they always want more. Well, that's right. And, and so far, what has the climate like uh, been like since you've been there? I know you're under constant surveillance. Uh, our cameraman and editor, Josh, uh, he was uh, detained by police along with independent journalist Luke Rodowski. I heard he got detained and, and Dan Dix. So you're under constant surveillance. Do you feel like you're under a constant threat? Well, it, it, you know, the, before we got here, uh, they were arrested and they basically tried to arrest everyone who was anywhere around the area that was associated with alternative media, just guilt by association. You know, it was it was uh, Dan Dix and Luke Radowski who went over and, and uh, confronted the people there. But, you know, anybody who was just in the area, they wanted to try to arrest them. And then even people who weren't down there at that time, uh, Charlie Skelton from The Guardian, his wife, they were evicted from the hotel just because they had been seen talking to these these people that they subsequently arrested. So that, that, that kind of guilt by association. But, you know, just before we went on air yesterday, uh, Josh was walking out of this hotel where I'm, I'm broadcasting from here carrying a camera. He wasn't shooting anything. And he was the police were called on him and they rushed to intercept him and detain him. Uh, my wife came down and, and got me and said, you know, they, they got jo uh, Josh, I think they're gonna arrest him. He was considered to be a quote, suspicious person or whatever, because he was carrying a camera. But I mean, David, that's David, absolutely David, that, That's but obvious, he, he was not in the free speech zone. <laughs> if he should have stayed in the free speech zone, it would have been all right. So that's right, but hey, you know. Go ahead. Hey, your Skype's cutting out a little bit right there. I think I think we got him back. Hey, tell us about any new developments. Well, you know, we didn't mention it to Alex earlier, Darren, but you know, there's been a lot of petty, vindictive 